Welcome to the Our Gem speaker series. We're glad to see so many people logging on. So again, welcome everybody. My name is Marie Schmidt. I work for the Community Water Resource Center at the University of Idaho in Coeur d'Alene. I'm part of the Our Gem Collaborative. We are a team of professionals working to preserve lake health and protect water quality by promoting community awareness of local water resources issues. Our team includes representatives from the University of Idaho, Coeur d'Alene Tribe, Idaho Department of Environmental Quality, Kootenai Environmental Alliance, the Coeur d'Alene Chamber, and CDA 2030. And this is part two of our four part Our Gem Speaker Series. We have two more presentations next week on Tuesday and Thursday. So I hope everybody will be joining us for those as well. But we'll get started here. Um, we're gonna leave everybody on mute. You can, there's a raise your hand feature that you can hit if you need to get our attention. You can also chat to us in the chat box and ask questions in the Q&A feature. We're going to leave most of the questions towards the end, but if you have something that, um, like a clarifying question, feel free to ask it and I can, I can ask David. So our speaker today is David Callahan. He's originally from San Antonio, Texas, and he has a degree in landscape architecture from Texas Tech University. He has served as a senior planner for the city of Dallas, Texas, the planning manager for Boulder County, Colorado, and the community development director for Fort Morgan, Colorado. Currently, he is the community development director for Kootenai County, where he's responsible for divisions of building inspection, land use planning, and code enforcement. So we're very excited to have him with us today. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you, David, and allow you to share your screen and then you can get us started. Perfect, I'll take it from here. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. Even if by Zoom, I have uh, at this point logged in about five to eight hours a day, a uh, week on Zoom. So it's become old hat in some ways, but it's fun to be able to talk about what my department does to preserve water quality. Uh, Marie mentioned to you that we have three divisions within community development, mostly or almost exclusively today, I'll be talking about what we do in land use planning and this expressly our land use and development code regulations to preserve water quality. For those of you that don't know, I should just mention that my jurisdiction is only between the cities. All of the cities within Kootenai County have their own counterparts to me and my staff. And if you have ever any question about whether you're in the city or the unincorporated county, in my view, the quickest and best way to find out is to go to our web page. I have the uh, address on the screen. And with the click of the button, you can see areas that are incorporated, as you see on this slide, that are in color. And then everything that's not in color is within my jurisdiction. Today, for the next roughly 30 minutes, I'll just be going over these two parts site disturbance and flood damage prevention that are embedded in our land use and development code. First up will be site disturbance. This is the, the part of our code that really gets most directly to preserving water quality. In the original legislation that um, goes back to the 90s, late 97 as I recall, it was expressly stated that, as you see on the screen, the purpose for our site disturbance regs was to protect water quality, surface and groundwater, and to protect private property rights. The way we do that is we require a site disturbance permit for most any new construction. As you, I won't waste your time reading things that are in bullets on the screen for this slide and other slides, but just bear in mind that as a general rule, most any new construction requires a site disturbance permit with some exceptions. These, these are the exceptions. Um, things like drilling holes, test wells for um, uh, septic fields, and anything that's already governed by another jurisdiction, that sort of thing. But otherwise, we do a review of every development on site. 
And we throw these things into two categories. The, my staff does a, a on-site review to determine whether the, the proposed work falls into what we call high risk or moderate risk. And then if it's in the high risk side, it requires a design professional, such as a landscape architect, architect engineer, professional engineer to do the work. Or if it's just flat ground and, and uh, it's pretty straightforward, then in some cases the homeowner can do the plan. That's actually all a requirement of code. I'm not going to go into those kinds of details, but all of our development code is available online and you can read it for yourself. But the kinds of things that we do have embedded in the code and we do check to see on our development uh, plan review for site disturbance permit review, I mean, is we check to see that cut and fill slopes don't exceed a certain percentage, as you see on the screen. We see that the cuts meet setback requirements, that they're actually not on adjacent property, which you'd be surprised how often that actually happens. We also look and check to see that the proposed plans meet some minimum requirements we have for stabilizing the construction entrance, cut and fill revegetation, and best management practices. And we check to see that water conveyance meets certain minimum standards, as you see here on the screen. In the site disturbance permit regs, we divide areas up into stream protection buffers and shoreline management areas. And we, we protect those areas according to certain standards. A class one stream, as you see on the screen, the screen gets a, a greater setback where there's nothing that can be built within 75 feet. For a class um, two stream, it's a lesser standard. These standards actually, the class one and class two, I mean, are are based upon um, IDL forestry standards that have been around for some considerable time. We didn't invent those in our code. And in that way, it's just a little easier for everyone to, to use the same standards. And then our shoreline management area is a 25 foot area that is unique, so far as I know, to Fuji County and our site disturbance regulation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that particular standard in just a moment. But the purpose of these buffers, again, is to maintain water quality and do the other things you see on the screen. Pretty self-explanatory. And again, we vary the standards based on setback. But here I just would like to editorialize for a moment, and I hope we can have a dialogue at the end of the discussion today, because I will tell you, I worry that our shoreline management area of 25 feet is insufficient. That's been the number that's been politically acceptable, if you will, in this community since the origination of the site disturbance regulation, which dates back to 97. And it seems less than de minimis in my view. I have workplaces in other parts of the country where the minimum setback for this sort of thing would be 200 feet. So I'll be curious to hear if there are any comments from you all about what sorts of standards we might entertain. I will tell you that the shoreline dimension was highly controversial four years ago when um, we updated the land use and development code. And I actually was in the position of trying to preserve our site disturbance program because we had a big push to eliminate it. But uh, for the moment, I just want to clarify a few things that may not be self-evident. We measure buffers, as you see here on the graphic. That's frankly easier than doing it horizontally on the map because this makes it easier to find the dimensions in the real world with people that are on the side. These are the kinds of things that um, we prohibit in the stream protection areas. And, and then allow. But basically the takeaway is number one, we prohibit any sort of disturbance except for the following. These have been embedded, these A, B, C, D, and E have been embedded in the code since 97 generally, except for um, E, which I'll talk about in a moment. Here on the shoreline management areas, I will just editorialize again for a moment. 
again in 2016, as I mentioned earlier, we were under pretty severe uh, push to eliminate our site disturbance regs. The Bend County Commissioners were not particularly on board. They were the ones you may recall actually ended up doing away with our building code for a year and made it optional. That's all been brought back for, for a whole again, but I, I was worried that we were going to lose our site disturbance program. So I went out and, and met with the public to try and figure out what would be a, a saving grace, if you will. And what evolved were these A, B, and C, D, and E exceptions that we wove into the code in 2016 so that it, we lightened up, if you will. You could do more things than what used to be a sacrosanct 25 foot shoreline management area. We actually used to call it the no disturbance zone. And you couldn't do anything in that zone without some special agreement by me. I found that to be unnecessarily cumbersome. It, it turned out to be that that was the major sticking point for people asking the commissioners to repeal our regulation. So we lightened up, as you see on A, B, C, D, and E on the screen. And that so far has proved to be successful in the sense that we are not getting wholesale, generally not getting wholesale problems with wiping out the, the entire site disturbance area. Although I'll show you in a moment some cases where we have had problems. But again, these were concessions, if you will, to keep our regulations in place. The exceptions on uh, ground disturbance for mechanical work, we used to not allow anything at all. Now we allow it, as you see under this first bullet on the screen. And then we also allow a maintenance, repair, replacement, and other things in the, um, the shoreline management area. Whereas before 2016, you had to actually put together a plan by a design professional, show us how everything was gonna be fine. That, of course, cost people whatever they had to pay the design professional. It took time to review. With the current regulations, we've woven things into the code that you can do. It's nothing more than a site plan to my staff. We review it, check, and see that it meets code. And then you can go to do things like what you see now on the screen, where on the right side of the screen, if you've got a retaining wall that's been there for time before our code, for instance, and now you merely want to replace it and you just give us a plan that shows that and that's fine you, you don't have to go through any more hoops if it's the area on the left and you want to do revetments or crib walls or, or some sort of uh, revegetation all of which again we can approve with merely a site plan then again that's entirely possible today in the past it was prohibited we do also allow simple and easy things that make, I hope, common sense. You, you can now, it wasn't true before 2016, but under today's regs, you can now remove dead and dying trees. Um, and of course, you can do weed mitigation. There has been a regular and routine problem that I, I bump into about once every couple of months. On, which is this bottom bullet on the screen, where we get um, people that pull a permit from IDL for a logging river. And that's through them and not us. And it's exempt from our site disturbance permit process. But then they want to later turn it into a private driveway. And, they, and then they do need a site disturbance permit. Um, there's a couple of problems with this current approach. One is that people that neighboring property owners don't believe the property under pulling the logging permit. They think that they're just getting ahead of the gun. And then they call me to complain and say, why are you allowing this? And I say, well, I don't have a choice. They pull a logging permit and they have the right to build a road under the logging permit. But the IDL standards are less than ours. They still have to do some mitigation and so on, but they're not as, as restrictive as ours are for grading and for um, revegetation. And so it is often the case that we have people pull these logging permits and then come back and do in fact want to build, make it uh, meet our 
site disturbance regulations, and that can be onerous because they've already got a road in the place where it may not meet our grading calcs requirements or the slope pitch required for uh, vehicles to cross the land safely. So that's the current sticking point we have with our current regulations. I will editorialize again for a moment and just say most of the time our site disturbance regulations work the way I believe they were envisioned. For that to actually happen, you need a property owner that agrees to go through the process, has got the economic wherewithal to, to do what's necessary, to hire design professionals and contractors to implement what the design professionals come up with. But I will say most of the time that is the case. We can usually tell when that's going to be the case because as you see on the, the screen here, we typically get site plans that are very thorough. They show us the grading of the property, inlets and outlets for storm drainage. That, you know, we can do a quick back of the envelope uh, view it for CIA and see that uh, the engineer or landscape architect has done the right math on grading and stormwater uh, retention and dealing with stormwater. And so again, with good practice, as you see on the screen with a willing owner and contractor and consultant, we usually end up with the right thing. And that means that uh, we get drainage plans that protect the environment, preserve the, uh, the overall water quality so that runoff doesn't exceed what it used to and achieve the purpose of the site disturbance program. I would say that's maybe 60% of the time. There are cases that are not quite to that standard. Here is one that dates back to uh, 2015. I just shot out to call from the assessor's office. You can see it's dated 2012 of the site before anything happened. And then in 2015, Kootenai Environmental Alliance staff contacted me and say, and told me they saw this from the lake side. So I sent out our code enforcement staff, and sure enough, this had all happened without a building permit, without a site disturbance permit. This is about a third of the site you're seeing. The other two thirds of the site are equally as bad. And you'll get a sense for that in a moment. But we stop work here, which is what we ordinarily do in a case like this. We explained to the property owner and then ultimately their consultant that they needed the site plan in net code and then we reviewed it and sure enough we got one it worked out at net code but here's another place where we run into problems if you look on the right side of the screen this plan was drawn by a design professional you can get a sense on the left even if you're not real familiar with uh, contour intervals and grading that this is a steep side i'll tell you it's about 100 feet from this point on earth i don't you probably can't see my cursor on the screen but from the, uh, the left side of the screen to the top of the screen, it's roughly a 100 foot drop. This is a proposed house right next to the lake. And then uh, the driveway comes in, this is the big uh, white area. And so we have a design professional telling me that this meets standards, meets our code. I'm a little skeptical, frankly, because of the reasons you can see here. That here's the driveway. The, uh, the slope is obviously more, 45% and more. There's places where my experience tells me this is not going to revegetate for years, if ever. And there's not a lot I can do about it because we had a design professional work it up. That person's put their reputation and, and literal stamp on the line to say that it needs code. Sometimes we're willing to get into a, a back and forth with design professionals and argue that these things just don't pass the straight face test. But here you have a case where arguably the retaining walls that you see, two of them on the right side of the screen, capture the most egregious um, sedimentation and erosion. And so even if the site doesn't revegetate, like we would like, and like it was in that first slide I showed you, it arguably meets the minimum standards of our code. I'm not entirely sanguine about this sort of thing, but it's the sort of thing I'd like to talk about at the end of the discussion if there's an interest. 
is that I'm hoping there's bound to be a better way than the way we're currently dealing with these things. Here's another example of a case where um, the owner decided to basically just denude nearly the site. If you uh, take a, a view of the entire thing, most of the original vegetation has been removed. IDL stepped in with us. We put a notice of violation of this, which is what we normally do when someone violates the, any of our code. The notice of violation is a lien against the property in the county record so that if this property ever goes up to, for um, refinancing or sale, it comes up in the title work. I will tell you that is. Typically, when we get code enforcement to be meaningful, part of the, the problem I have, and, and the staff here has always had with Cleveland County, is that no group of county commissioners yet has been willing to allow my staff to take a proactive uh, enforcement action against this sort of thing. We don't typically go to court unless there's a life safety issue. And so environmental degradation can occur. It can go on for years until the property sale sells or is refinanced. This particular property, you see this happened in 2016. I noticed recently on the county assessor's records that at least the grass is growing in as you see here. But I, to my knowledge, IDL was never entirely uh, able to get all the sand removed. And so it, you know, again, it's one of the flaws in our current site disturbance program that I would like to find a better way to, um, to deal with that. Moving on to our flood damage prevention, these are really our floodplain regulations. These similarly date to the late 1990s. I will tell you that that's pretty late in the game. My experience in dealing with floodplain regs Many jurisdictions around the country had something on the books, especially the major jurisdictions, big cities, um, had something on the books in the late 70s. And that's largely because that's when federal government stepped in and started making it possible to do floodplain regulation. We are part of the National Flood Insurance Program. And I bring up this. Um, alphabet soup of acronyms for you because there are at least three of these I want you to try and have as a takeaway today because they're useful and meaningful if you're ever looking at our flood conference. The first one is the BFD, which is the base flood elevation. That's important because that's the, the point we measure from, from which we expect the lowest floor of any structure to be three feet above in order to keep people safe. The, um, the second most important one on here is this SFHA, that's the Special Flood Hazard Area. In days gone by, we used to just call this the, the floodplain. You know, back in the day, it was the 100-year floodplain was what most jurisdictions worked on. That's still an important term today, the floodplain, I mean. But we don't, I'll show you in a moment, we don't really refer to it as the floodplain so much, or the 100 years, excuse me, floodplain so much as we do as a 1%, and I'll show you that in a moment. Another takeaway is this A zone and uh, some of these zones you see. It. Those are zones you'll find are actually listed on our maps. The reason they're important is if they're listed as an A zone, we can find a, a base flood elevation. Whoops, pardon me, I didn't mean to do that. And then the final one on this way, on this list of acronyms, the final term I'd like you to know is the flood what? The reason that's important and distinctive from the flood plain or the special flood hazard area is the flood way is an area within the flood plain. Sometimes the flood plain and flood way are the same thing if you're in a, a channel or a um, uh, confined area. But the floodway is the most dangerous area. As you see on the screen, it's the high hazard area. It tends to be where people die, frankly, because they're swept away and it's the most voluminous, best running water in the flood. Here you see it in just a different way. Again, the special flood hazard area is the flood plain. 
and you can get a sense for the floodplain is or floodway is embedded within the flood. And then this goes back to that one percent that I wanted you to understand as well. For at least 25 years that I know of, we can commonly refer to the 100 year flood, but over time that's given away to this one percent um, nomenclature because it, it's easier for people to understand that what we used to mean by the 100 year flood was the chance of it flooding was roughly once in every 100 years. But people weren't able to, to really understand that what that really means is you have a 1% chance of it happening in any given. So that's why the nomenclature has changed. Finally, here, uh, I, I hope you've been patient with me, but we're at the point where you can understand why floodplain regulations preserve water quality. There are two obvious ways. Floodplains tend to wash out major areas in the floodway and then all that affects water quality but also they tend to flood, uh, flood events tend to wash out utilities if they're not properly protected so one of the important things that any nfip program does is keep utilities out of harm's way and in that way preserve our water quality flood damage is enormous. It, it's I've seen in the, across the nation that the uh, FEMA staff has estimated that we save something on the order of about 1.6 billion dollars a year in cost by having floodplain regulations. And as you see on the screen here, if we were to have a major flood event in our county, the estimates are we'd be in the hundreds of billions of dollars of cost. So it's useful and important to have a program. The other thing that people don't normally think about, except if you've been tracking uh, the major flood event on our coast right now with Sally, you've noticed that floodplain flood events tend to be major disasters and can easily become catastrophic. That's what they're calling Sally right now, catastrophic flooding. And it is, in fact, statistically the case that it's the biggest general natural disaster we have in uh, Teton County. The, the kinds of things that we specifically do in our floodplain regulations to preserve water quality is we prevent development in the floodway with some few exceptions. We will allow reconstruction of existing facilities if they meet certain standards. Uh, floodplain development permits are required for any development in the floodplain. And then once we review those kinds of things, we make sure that that development meets the minimum standards embedded in the floodplain regulation. And when we do uh, subdivision review, we look at, at the proposal to make sure there is at least a minimum building site that's outside of the special flood hazard or floodplain and that the access is to the individual lots is outside of the floodplain. And then probably the, among the most important things we do is with our floodplain regulations, we ensure that there aren't any new sewage disposal systems within the floodplain. We are part of FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program. The reason that's important to remember is that that allows us to make flood insurance available to any of the roughly 400 people in Kootenai County that have homes in the floodplain. As part of that program, we must adopt and enforce our floodplain regulations. And we just updated our regs last year to meet the current state and federal model. It is a voluntary process. We don't have to be part of the NFIP, but there are good reasons to be, as you see the bullets on the screen. Flood insurance is not available if you're not part of NFIP. And the, probably the most important reason is if you know, go back to that slide and remember the hundreds of millions of dollars of cost that we could have in a major flood event. If we're not part of NFIP, we're not eligible for financial assistance from the federal government. 
And typically in a catastrophic event, the feds pick up 75% or at least 75% or sometimes more of the cost. Another thing that I'd like you to, to take away from this is that we are part of the community rating system, again, necessary and required in order for us to be part of the NFIP program. Community rating system is something we do every year in the state of Idaho to make sure that all of our regs, the way we are enforcing, and our procedures are compliant with um, the state and national model. And I'm proud to say that if you look on the left, this we are ranked sixth currently in the state of Idaho, which means we're just one class position away from the best there is in Idaho. And that puts us uh, with the ability to give our insurance premiums a 15% reduction. Here, I just want you to, to be aware if, if you're ever in need of knowing exactly where the floodplains are, they are all on on our uh, web page you can merely pull up that same web page i showed you earlier for the city's incorporated areas you can easily drill down in the floodplains when you do you can start to see not only the floodplain which you see here on this screen on the right side i mean if with um if you can make out the purple lines that actually shows the bfe as you go downstream the blue area is the floodplain itself, and then this cross-hatched area is the, the actual flood of water. All of these maps, I can tell you as an aside, date back to um, the 70s in some cases, the 80s and others. In my view, they are long overdue for national overhaul. I hear that FEMA is rolling out this next year or two new work based on LIDAR, which is a new way of using uh, more sophisticated technology to get topo topographical mapping that's more accurate than what's been done in the past. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, here again, we just have nomenclature. I won't bore you with the details, except that this is useful and necessary when you're establishing base flood elevation. Um, the base flood elevation, again, is something that we, we know, we measure, we can find for you, just call the staff if you ever have a concern about knowing where flood elevations are in any part of the county. Um, this, again, is just to remind you that there are different levels of floodplains, um, but the one that you need to deal most frequently with is the 100-year uh, flood and then the flood wave. Here, I just want to make it clear that one of the things that we do for every building that's within the floodplain and outside of the floodway is to make sure it meets our minimum standards for the lowest floor of the building, at least three feet above the base flood elevation, and that we have proper venting so that flood waters can flow in and out of the structure and not cause harm. These again meet meet certain standards embedded in the code which are, that are based on the state and federal law. Another thing we do for uh, security and making sure that we're keeping people out of harm's way is we get a surveyor to literally find the elevation of that lowest floor above the BFP and we document it as you see here. And this is the sort of evidence we provide in the community rating system audit to show that the state and the feds that we're doing right. We have a significant number of floodways in the county. You can zoom in on them on that same web map I showed you. These again are the extremely hazardous areas, so just so you know. And again, here's the best way to reach us. Um, if you have any questions about anything, anything I talked about or anything else we do, this is just the main general number. The reception that's answering this number can point you to the, in the right direction for, for any help you need. The 1070 number um, can also get you to our front counter planners, which are the ones who deal with our site disturbance permit regulations and uh, the floodplain map. And then the map again is this um, web page you see at the top of the page. So, with that, I will stop sharing and open it up for any questions.
or discussion that you would like to have. Great, thank you, David. So we do have a couple questions that have been coming in. And um, as I said, feel free to ask more using that Q&A feature, but I will start with the first few here. <clears throat> Why is the setback for class two streams greater than shoreline properties? Well, again, we have the luxury of mirroring what the state law does for um, forest practice act. And no one has argued that with us. We have had considerable argument by the, um, I won't name names, but I'll be so bold as to say, um, organizations that front major lakes, the property owners organizations, because these are highly valuable properties. And, you know, any one of them is, starts off at the half million, more typically in the couple of million dollar range. And it, in this community, there hasn't frankly been the political will to go beyond 25 feet. Yeah. Um, okay. We may have some follow up questions to that. I'll let I would encourage that. Yeah. I, I will, you know, just to bait the, anyone out there that would like to talk, I will be so bold as to say I, I see a tipping point in our community. I'm meeting more and more people that are sort of up to here with development and pushing back. We're seeing it more in public hearings. We're getting more requests for denials of things. And we are getting more complaints by neighbors that are, that are people that are sort of fed up with the, the slide I showed you where a property is denuded. And I have two county commissioners, at least, that are entertaining the thought of allowing us to be more than merely a notice of violation. You know, I've thrown out there the notion that what I really need is a full-time equivalent uh, position, a county attorney, mm -hmm. who I could rely on to sue in district court if, when we need it. That, is, frankly, is about a ninety to one hundred and twenty thousand dollar position mm -hmm. when you throw in fully loaded benefits. So it's a big deal. Yeah. Well, we'll see if any other questions come through on that. Um, Let's see, if a view shed is allowed, does that authorize running a lawn right to the water's edge if bushes, et cetera, are minimum, minimally blocking view? No, we still have the, the requirement that that view shed must preserve the vegetation up the first three feet. So they're actually only able to limb from three feet up to the, the uh, one third of the, the crown. And only for a dimension of, if I remember right, about 30%. And so the existing vegetation is supposed to stay in place along that at least the 25 foot corridor. And no new grass areas outside of that. But you, you know, go back to that slide I show you where they ignored it, denuded it, and then I leaned the property. And now years have gone by and we still have grass. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing that's just frankly irritating. Yeah. Um, are there restrictions on what weed killers can be used along the shoreline? And I would add to that, um, just personally, are there restrictions on fertilizer types that can be used right along the shoreline? Uh, fertilizer is verboten. You're not supposed to do that in the 25 foot at all. Yeah. Um, it, of course, it's excruciatingly hard to enforce that. The only, only way I know we've ever been successful is to catch them in the act. You know, otherwise people just go do it and we never know. Yeah. On the um, weed issue, that's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse because the state requires, has requirements for what you get to use for um, herbicide. And I don't have staff that can enforce that. But the answer to your question is yes, they're supposed to meet certain minimum standards for the, that the state puts into place for what you can use on noxious weeds. Okay. And that, to my knowledge, is true in every state in the United States. Okay. Um, we have a question about, can the commissioners be held personally liable for intentionally failing to enforce the codes effectively? 
No, they can't, neither can the staff. State law in Idaho and almost every state that I know of gives governmental immunity to these things. The lawsuit that would be more successful, in my view, would be just challenging our regs themselves. Mm -hmm. You didn't hear that from me. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Um, how does the county plan to manage or control the unbridled growth that is occurring in the county in order to use the existing infrastructure, i.e. roads, intersections, etc.? It's becoming apparent that growth is out of is outgrowing the current infrastructure and some management should be considered. Well, I couldn't agree more. I, there are several answers to that question. Let me take the uh, low lying fruit first. Um, the current county commissioners have authorized my staff and I to put together a white paper where we're gonna throw back uh, to the commissioners, here's how growth management has historically worked in this country. And so it's at least a springboard for discussion of what we might possibly do in the future. Another answer to the question is we currently don't do much of anything for growth management because I will be so bold as to say is that for the entirety of my office's existence, we've been a pro-growth community and no one has cared. I am starting to experience the tipping point like I have seen in other places. I worked for Boulder County for 12 years where it was ideologically opposite of here. I won't bore you with the details, but we had things like, um, by the time I left, we had a requirement that single family homes being demolished had to be decommissioned and recycled. Mm. Nothing like that is remotely attainable here. Right. But I'm starting to see a change in mindset. People are moving here from other parts of the country. They're a little bit frustrated and other things. And they're tired, you know, going back to that question raised about personal liability, I think they're tired of, of the county not taking a more proactive stance. So I, I see things shifting. I will be so bold as to say that we need political push for that to actually happen. And it needs to happen on variable levels. Okay. We have another question about development. Development pressure in Kootenai County is extreme and currently only 25% of native riparian buffers exist around Coeur d'Alene Lake. What is the county doing with regard to enforcement of the 25 foot shoreline management area regulation for the properties that are currently non-compliant with the law? Well, again, as before, we, the simple answer is that we don't do anything. We, if we know about it, we put a notice of violation on the property, and then that can sit there for years. And again, as before, unless and until we have the political um, interest in doing things differently, I, I don't have the authority to do anything differently. I, I have no staff that can go out and make people do the right thing. We can't retroactively force them to revegetate. Okay. Uh, it's a tough one at the moment. There's another question kind of going along with that. Are there any court actions taken against violators or design professional licensing? So in the case I'm of- sorry, I had a, a screen pop up on my side and telling me I have another, another meeting. Okay. So would you repeat the question? Sure. Um, are there any court actions taken against violators or design professional licensing? I'm glad you brought that one up. I, mm -hmm. I have toyed with the idea of uh, design professional going forward with that. I've even broached it with the county commissioners in the most egregious cases. They weren't, they didn't have to do with site disturbance. It had to do with more with uh, building permit issues. And again, as before, I think the current county commissioners are more receptive to that sort of thing the next time we bump into a really egregious problem. On, uh, I'm sorry, I got brain locked. Re re refresh my memory in the first part of that question. Um, are there court actions court that are taken against violators? We only have gone to court 
three times in the seven years I've been here. And those were for cases where I convinced commissioners that were really life-threatening. We haven't gone to court over environmental issues yet. I think it's conceivable, but I, again, where I really need help is that, you know, people need to start telling the commissioner that this is important. Okay. Let's see. Does the viewshed corridor exception within the 25 foot setback mean you can cut everything down within this setback area to improve your view? No, again, it's, you have to keep three feet and then keep the tree that you're limbing up to the, at the top, I think no more than one third of the crown if I remember. So the trees are still in place, all the vegetation three feet and below is in place, and then the crown above is left in place. And, and again, you know, that was a concession we made to try and keep our regulations. The, the proposal was a gun. And so my thought was some of what you want is better than none of what you want. And that's what resonated at the time. Great. We often see construction that violates the setback ordinance and roads cut down to the shore or excavation and fill dumped down a hill toward the lake without a site disturbance permit. When these are reported to the county, are there consequences? Does the county monitor compliance with current building and site disturbance permits? Everything that's reported to my code enforcement officers is logged into our electronic tracking system. We determine if it is a violation, and then we take action with the notice of violation. If there, it was a case where it was life-threatening or I could argue there was imminent harm to the environment, I think I could get the county commissioners to take legal action. So we take all of these complaints very seriously. I would encourage you um, to contact my code enforcement staff anytime you see anything like what was described. Okay. There's another question kind of related. Do you receive information about logging road permits ahead of time? How do you find out about these site disturbances? We don't. We typically find out by neighbors calling and complaining, and then we call IDL staff and they tell us whether there's a logging permit or not. Okay. Um, let's see, I saw one other question. The NFIP guidebook only requires first floor elevations to be at or above the BFE. Why does the county require three, three feet above it? The three feet is one of the handful of things we do that the Fed and the state allow to go above and above and beyond the minimum requirement. And if you go back to that slide that I showed where it, it, I said we got a 15% reduction, that's part of how we get the reduction. We have to do things more than the minimum required. And I, I will tell you from my experience in dealing with floodplain regulations for 40 years, is that you need to start from the idea that floodplain regulations and floodplains are not absolute. We don't know absolutely, especially when you think about the hydrology that's been done to demarcate floodplains. Most of it goes back at this stage 1987. A lot has happened since 87. And so the three feet is one of the cushions to, to catch up for the fact that we don't know exactly where the floodplain is. And my guess is it's probably a lot worse than the maps show it is. Okay. Okay. We have a comment. Climate change is real. How can we plan ahead? Adaptation plan is used by most progressive entities. Well, I, in, at the risk of inciting a riot, my suggestion is the hard part to overcome here is progressive. In this community, that's a four letter word. That needs to change. Mm -hmm. We need to find common ground. We need to find ways to communicate with each other so that it's not a stick in the eye every time we want to have a conversation about what's the right thing to do for the environment. I am all for it. I think it's useful and necessary. 
But I think as a community, I see we have a long way to go before we have common ground where we can actually have a civil discussion about these things. Yeah. What is a fine for a violation? Is it a $300 misdemeanor? And if so, what percentage of landowners will just pay the fine and continue to violate? There is no fine. Again, we do a notice of violation against the property. And the only fine we get at the end of the process, you know, if you go back to that slide I showed where they denuded the site and they still have the notice of violation on the property, the grass is grown in, someday that's going to come up in refinance or sell, sell to a new owner. That's when that we get them to pay my staff's cost of, and it is roughly $300 for having done the notice of violation and in order to get the paperwork in place so that so that they can then go forward with anything new. Um, but we don't have a, a to distinguish things. We don't have a fine up front. That fine comes at the end of the process once someone wants to actually do the right thing and fix the problem. Okay. okay. Is there a public record list of all properties violating uh, the floodplain requirements? Violation is a word I hesitate to use. Even the federal government acknowledges that there are a great many structures that are allowed to be in the floodplain. You just can't add on to them. And, and new developments allowed in the floodplain as long as it meets those standards that we've discussed briefly. I think there is a list of properties that are in the flood way and, and also a list of properties that are what the feds call repetitive loss. By federal law, I can't tell you what those are and I don't know either. Okay. Um, it's one of those strange aspects of federal law. <laughs> but I, I think part of the answer to the question is we can at least find properties that are in the flood plain and we know whether they're problematic. Okay. Do you think it would be attainable for road construction of any kind to be required to get a site disturbance permit within the setback? Which setback do you think they mean, Marie? <laughs> um, you can see if there's the shoreline or that's my guess. We can see if they clarify. But that would be my guess would be the sh uh, for example, yes, the shoreline. Oh, okay. Well, we, we already can deal with roads in the shoreline. They're not supposed to be there. That's the starting point. And mm -hmm. then and we do require, um, unless it's exempt, we do require a site disturbance permit for all roads that are not exempt. Right. So I guess maybe the question is, should, could we go politically to the side of, of not having exemptions? Do you that's, think? Yeah, that's my reading of the question, I think. Well, yeah, it goes back to the broader discussion of the politics of this community. At the moment, I would be surprised if we could get that, because I don't see there being a majority of people showing up at meetings to tell the commissioners that's where we should go. Mm -hmm. I can imagine a time when that changes. You know, a lot of what needs to happen is, again, in my view, we need to engage ourselves, our citizenry, and have meaningful discussions about what's the right thing to do. Okay. How is the county protecting our lake and aquifer if basic preventative codes are not enforced? That sounds like a rhetorical question to me. I think I'll sidestep that one. Okay. Well, um, yeah, it sounds like you've kind of answered that before and just saying anyway. <laughs> you address this with the county commissioners. Right. All right. Is there, are there any more questions? Any follow-up questions or any other comments for David? Well, Marie, uh, thank you for making this easy. Everyone, thank you for your interest. I am grateful to be part of your program. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your presentation. We're getting lots of thank yous in the in the comments. Okay. Um,
Um, thanks everybody for joining us again today. We do have presentations next week. We have um, Tuesday, the 22nd, we have Jamie Bruner with the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality and Rebecca Stevens with the Coeur d'Alene Tribe talking about management on Coeur d'Alene Lake. And then on Thursday, the 24th, we have Dr. Kim Holzer with the Idaho State Department of Agriculture talking about aquatic invasive species in our watershed. So please, if you haven't already, sign up for those at the Our Gem website. And uh, we hope to see you next week. And again, David, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. You're very welcome, Marie. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.